one of those days that made me thankful that we have heaters. <laughs> Awful cold outside. I wouldn't want to be in a church in the old fashioned ones where everything was breezy and you had your little campfire beside you. <laughs> I'll take this any day. Brother Eli, you know, fucked up. Eli! I was going to say you called him Eli. <laughs> I'm sorry. <clears throat> I knew what I meant, brother. <laughs> Well, we've been looking at a batch of basics course. We've been looking at what we believe, why we believe it. We looked at the existence of God and how we know that God exists. We looked at the Bible and why we use the Bible, that is, the inspired Word of God. We looked at why we use the King James Version of the Bible. And we started last week at looking at the attributes of God. Before we go any farther, does anybody remember their memory verse from last week? There are three that bear witness in heaven, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. And these three are one. Our memory verse for this week is going to be found in John chapter 4, verse 24. John 4, 24. If someone wants to just go ahead and read that. Yeah, I'm sorry. I didn't write God is the Spirit, and they that must that worship Him must worship Him in spirit and truth. We're looking at the deity of God, and we've been looking at the attributes of God. We talk about the big three O's, as anybody remember what they are. Does anybody know what the three big attributes of God are to begin with, without the O's? Omniscience. And what are those? What is omniscience? All um, knowing. What about omnipresence? Everywhere. He's everywhere. And then finally, omnipotence. All He's all powerful. As we're looking at God right now, we are looking at Him as being a spirit. And we took notice that last week, one of the main ones we looked at with the natural attributes was that He is alive. <coughs> and then we got Him being a spirit. Talking about God in His invisible form without a body. We also compared it to idols. And how they are, even the Word of God compares the living God with idols. How idols are dead, they can do nothing for you, but God is alive. And because He's alive, all power is given unto Him. There is no co false concept in God, but when we worship Him in sincerity and truth, we see God for who He really is. When man makes an idol, he really makes a mockery of God because he's making a perversion of God. No man has seen God and lived. And we even talked about just in fun our quick concept of Jesus Christ, that little baby in the, excuse me, that little baby in the manger, and our depiction of him. He lived, but yet we focus on Jesus being white, the blacks focus on Jesus being black. There is no true identity there. But rather it's our own concept of what our baby Jesus looks like. Continuing on looking at God as a spirit, we're going to look at one other, several other things. We're going to look at the angel of the Lord. We talked about this years ago when we did our Bible study on angelology. We know that Jesus Christ is saying yesterday, today, and forever. 
but he was not always flesh. There came a point in time when he actually took on humanity. The Word of God is very explicit with that. John chapter 1 tells us that the Word became flesh. When he was born of Mary, that's when he gained his humanity. However, what was Jesus Christ like before he took on humanity? Well, he was a spirit. But yet we all know there's three personas of the Trinity. As mentioned by the scripture verse from last week, there's the Father, there's the Holy Ghost, and there's Jesus Christ. What did Jesus Christ look like before he received his humanity? Did he ever make any appearances throughout the scriptures? And the answer is yes. Those appearances, if we get into uh, theology, will be referred to as Christophanies. If you look in your Bible, the majority of the time in the Old Testament, not every time this phrase is used, but whenever you see the phrase, the angel of the Lord, pay close attention to see if there's any attributes or characteristics of God tied with them. For example, when we go back to Genesis chapter 3, if someone would please turn to Genesis chapter 3. And why are we looking at this? Because I can't remember if it's the Mormons or the Jehovah Witnesses that believe that before Christ came to earth, he was Michael the Archangel. Once he came, he was Jesus Christ, but now he's up in heaven as Michael the Archangel. No, that's not true. Jesus Christ always existed. He just did not always have flesh. So when we look at Genesis chapter 3, I better turn there. Did I tell you verse 28? Because I'm thinking I'm getting my verses mixed up. It's probably not 28, brother. I had several different chapters and books in my head and I didn't write them down. Well, by logical deduction, it's not verse 28 then. <laughs> but it is verse 8. If someone will go ahead and read that. So the Spirit of God was walking in the cool of the day. How in the world does a spirit walk? Unless we have a Christophany, Jesus Christ, walking with him already in the cool of the garden. What about Ezekiel chapter 1? That famous passage that we refer to for discussing cherubim. And if someone would go ahead and start reading in verse. Down to verse 27. As we're looking at this passage, with these two verses particularly, Ezekiel gets a glimpse into the throne room of God. 
And who does he see sitting on the throne, or what does he see sitting on the throne? The appearance of a man. If God is a spirit, he really doesn't have an appearance. So when we're looking at the Father or the Holy Ghost, who's seen the Holy Ghost? We felt him, but we haven't seen him. So in order to have an appearance, what does, must this be? A Christophany. Ezekiel saw in the throne room of God, and he seen Jesus Christ sitting on the throne. He seen the appearance of a man. When we look at Scripture and the Trinity, the only one who visibly ever manifests himself that we're aware of in visible, visible form, not by a sign of occurrence. We know the wind exists because it blows. I realize that. We know the Holy Ghost exists because we've all, I'm hoping we've all seen a movement service. I know even now at Bible school, we can attest to that we've seen the Holy Ghost move from people. In fact, I even remember one service brother trying to watch him go from the girl's side up to the platform and then come right at me. I mean, you can do, but I didn't see the Holy Ghost. I seen the manifestation through him working on other people. But when we look at Scripture, the only appearance of God that we have in visible form is Jesus Christ. When he uh, met Abraham. Yes, and when he came down and met Abraham, that wasn't the Father, but that was a Christophany. That was Jesus Christ coming down and meeting with Abraham. When Jared, when Joshua was standing there and there was a strong man with a sword by his side, and he said, are you for us or against us? That was a Christophany. That was Jesus Christ standing before him. So the only part of the Trinity that ever manifested himself in visible form that you can reach out and touch and distinguish visibly is Jesus Christ. And we know that these manifestations are more than just a man or an angel because it's the characteristics that go with it. When we go back to the angel of the Lord and Joshua's getting ready to fall down and worship him, he tells him don't, not to. When we look at even Revelation, sometimes um, things get mixed up and people misunderstand what they're looking at. John's talking and he thinks he's talking with an angel. And when he gets ready to bow down and worship him, what does the angel do? He allows them because it's Jesus Christ. Angels do not receive glory, which means I messed up Joshua. But still, angels will always refuse worship because it's not theirs to take. It's God's alone. So if you ever see the phrase, the angel of the Lord, or any attribute that goes with God attributed to them or them allowing man to worship him, it is a Christophany. Continuing on, there's one other aspect I want to talk about with God being a spirit before we move on. As we look at all these other um, idols and everything else, they're always in animal form. Not taken away from God, but we don't fully understand God. So what does he do? He comes down and tries to help us to understand by putting it into our language. And what he does is he'll use similes or descriptions. There's a verse in the book of Psalms that says that he'll take us under his wings. Does God physically have wings? If not, he would be pretty funny looking if we add in all the descriptions we have of God. He has hands, he has arms, he has wings, he's a tower. When we look at God, there are some terms that he used in our language to help us better understand the infinite. To better understand who he is because we could not fully comprehend it otherwise. He's probably not giving us a full portrayal, but he's putting it in a language where we can understand. When he says 
there, Bobby, that he'll take us under his wings, we get the image of a mother hen taking her hen, her chicks, under her wings, where she'll let nothing, absolutely nothing, come between her and those <coughs> chicks. In fact, I know there's an illustration already said, whether it's a true account or not, I don't know. But there's a great old storm one day in the barnyard. And the farmer the next day goes out to collect his damage and see what's going on and tally it up. And as he's there, in his frustration, he sees this dead mother hen. So what he does is he goes up and he kicks it. And as soon as he kicks it, all these little peeps come running out from underneath. That hen gave its life to protect those peeps. So when we are looking at the descriptions of God and how he describes himself, because he is a spirit, and because we cannot fully understand who God is, we can take that and realize that no matter what comes our way, even if it seems that it's the worst storm ever, He is going to take care of us. In fact, we can even take that and almost apply that illustration to us in sin because God took on sin for us. Otherwise, it would have crushed and killed every one of us and neither of us would have entered into heaven because we weren't a pure sacrifice. There was sin. But yet he ate sin and the price of it that we may live forever. God uses illustrations to show who he is. If someone wants to go ahead and read Psalm 91 verse 4.
So God has self-consciousness. He's very much aware of His own name. When we look at the Gospels, Jesus Christ takes on that same name. Seven times He says, I am. I am. I am the gate. I am the door. I am the shepherd. And He continues on. So God is aware of Himself. How about Isaiah 45 and verse 5? He is aware that He is the only true God. How about God has self-determination? If someone would read, please read Job chapter 23 and verse 13. Job 23 and 13. And Romans 9 11. Romans 9 11. So he's going to pour out wrath on his enemies. He can sense um, he has sensibility in that he is just. He can pour out wrath on his enemies and spare those who are his children. Someone else read Genesis 6 6 please. Sad. Therefore, he was rationalizing. He was being sensible. How about God has feeling? One of the greatest ways we know that God has feeling, and we can read Genesis, Genesis, John chapter three and verse sixteen, which probably the majority of us can quote, if not all of us. For God, what? He loved. He has feeling. Not only does he have a feeling of love, but if we look all the way back in the Garden of Eden, why was man created in the first place? Fellowship. Fellowship with God. God wanted to commune with somebody. And when you look at that whole garden experience, it was just God trying to draw close to his creation. He was fellowshipping with them. Even the verse we read earlier, Genesis 3, 8, he walked with them in the cool of the evening. You know, it wasn't just created, I'm glad you're here with me, you can worship me. But rather, he wanted to commune with them. He wanted to have fellowship with them. He came down every day and walked and talked with them. How do you have a relationship with somebody if you don't ever spend time with them or talk to them? You don't. It's not much of a relationship. And I'm sure... There's those of us in here who's probably had friendships where you started off, but it was always one-sided, and it's like, well, if they're not going to put anything into it, why should I? It's not really a friendship. It's all one way. I give, I give, I give. But God has feelings. He desires relationships. 
relationship with man. And it didn't stop there, but he still desires it today. So it's not just a one-time feeling, but it's continual. As we look at the scriptures, he's constantly trying to pull man to him. And we look at the prophets. Every time you see him reaching out for Israel to come to him. Even there, the verse where Jesus Christ is crying there outside of Jerusalem, looking over it, weeping. If only you would have known. God has feeling, and he desires fellowship. But on top of that, God also has a will. First Thessalonians verse chapter 4 and verse 3. If someone would please read that. First Thessalonians 4, verse 3. And Daniel chapter 4, verse 35. First Thessalonians 4, 3, and Daniel 4, 35. For this is the will of God, even your sanctification, that ye should abstain from fornication. So this is the will of God. How about Daniel 4.35? Now he hath ordained And we can even go through the Gospels. And I don't have it written down in your notes, but we look at Jesus Christ in the Garden of Gethsemane once again. What did he pray? Father, not my no. but thine will. We see him other times mentioning that he did not come to do his own will, but he came to do the Father's will. Yeah. You know, there's just that whole connection right there that God has a will. He has a plan. He has a desire. Even looking at end time events. We find throughout the scriptures many times, and if I say that too many times, slap me. I say that phrase, we find. But God's the one that raises up kings, and he's the one that tears them down. Why is he the one that raises them up? That his will will be done. If we look at the children of Israel going into captivity, do you think they enjoyed being taken captive into Babylon? No. Do you think they enjoyed watching their temple be destroyed? How about the walls torn down? That, that symbol of security. For us it's a symbol. For them it was literal. <clears throat> no. But yet scripture declares that God calls Nebuchadnezzar his servant. Why? Because he was fulfilling God's will. Why did they go into captivity? <clears throat> because they kept going back to other gods. Disobedience. Disobedience. And God told him, turn from me, yeah. turn back to me, otherwise this is going to happen. Yeah. Jeremiah prophesied it. Yeah. And because they would not turn back, they were taken into captivity, and Nebuchadnezzar is a servant of God. But we also think about that man, Nehemiah, that cupbearer, crying, and the king sees him. And after years and years of being released, and this was after the Babylon, the Israelites could go back. God raises up a man named Cyrus that everything should be, I shouldn't say everything, but the majority should be taken back to the temple. The gold instruments, the vessels, the furniture. And scripture also calls Cyrus the servant of God. Why? Because they were fulfilling God's will. When we look at end time events, even the situation we're in, I don't see America in end time events because it's focused on the Middle East, um, Syria, Lebanon. We really have no role in it except for America is going to have to go through like everybody else and force with the side effects. They're going to have to use the mark to buy and eat so forth. But even there, we might not like who's in president, but you know what? God's using them for whatever reason to bring His will for the end time around. You know, we can all get mad at Abinadab and trying to bring about the fifth imam, the twelfth imam. And look at the whole world stage and all the political figures and everything that's going on, economic crisis. And I'm sure there's probably the majority of us 
who abhor the fact that we're going towards a cashless society and we can see it and there's no change. But yet, we know it has to get there. And God is using key people to bring about His will for the end times. God has the will. And I won't read every scripture verse because we've just focused on, we all know that God has emotion. We've all read the Bible, I hope, and we've all seen that God gets angry, He gets sad. He experiences grief, John 3.16. He loved the world that He sent His only Son. He gets angry. He wants to annihilate all of Israel and He repents that He ever made man. And what happened? Moses goes up on Mount Sinai and starts talking. I shouldn't say Mount Sinai, but he goes up and he talks to God once again. And God changes his mind. Great. We know that God is a very just God. Not only do we know that because he told us that specifically, but when he moved, when the Israelites moved into the land of Canaan, what did they do? They killed off all the other people to eradicate their religions. When we look at Saul and establishing becoming the first king of Israel in our eyes, in Jewish minds, is David. But what did he do? He chased down and killed all the witches, all the sorcerers, all the false, uh, all the soothsayers. Why do you think he had to go to Endor to visit a soothsayer? <clears throat> because God did not permit them in the land of Israel. We know that God hates. We know that He speaks. He sees. He hears. He knows. He cares. But God, as we look at all these, He has characteristics that reveal Him as a person. And it's not that God is like us, but we're like God. Because we are created in His image. That's why we have a mind. That's why we have free will. That's why we can we have those personal characteristics. And when we look at that, we can even relate better to God being a person because we can understand who we are as a person. We get angry. We get mad. We get upset. Why? Because God has all these feelings. He has all these emotions. And we are created in His image. Does anybody have any thoughts or any questions? If not, let's just bow our heads and prepare our hearts for service. Gracious Heavenly Father, we give you all praise and glory for everything you've done for us and have continued to do. And I pray that you be with each one of us today, Lord. Let us prepare our hearts and our minds for the service, Lord, if we haven't already. Let us prepare our hearts and our minds to receive the message which you have for us today. That we would fall in good soil, Lord. That we would take it with us wherever we go. We pray, Lord, that you just anoint the speaker today, Lord, as he brings forth your message, Lord. We pray that our hearts would be willing and ready to receive it. We pray that we would be in one mindset and one accord, that the Holy Ghost could manifest himself as he so desires. Moving visibly as if he so chooses. We give you all praise and glory for everything you've done for us and shall continue to do. And we the song leader and the musicians, Lord, as they lead us in worship and let's praise you upon the string instruments and the vocal cords, Lord. We pray that you give them the songs that you have us to sing today that to worship you in spirit and truth, Lord. And we give you all praise and glory for, for you alone are holy and worthy. 